Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Episcopal Parish's class over the history of Christian worship. We have concluded two major sections of our study into Christian worship. The first study being on baptism and its historic practices, and we finished last week with our section on the Holy Communion. Now we shift to a more general topic, which has a particular contour within the history of Christianity, which is daily prayer. Daily prayer is something that in all walks of Christian life is a vitally important part of the way that we foster our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a primary facet in the way that we develop in our Christian walk in charity. Daily prayer is honestly as old as the practice of Christianity itself, and as old as the Old Testament, and even far, far, far older than that as it comes to the practice of world religions. Daily prayer takes on particular kinds of facets within Christianity that has deep roots within the Bible itself, of course. But we're going to start this discussion by talking about what specifically do we look to as primary ways in which Christians have always done the practice of daily prayer. This is going to take a more official kind of view of this, which is what are the sources that we can look at in the Christian tradition that enumerate the ways in which Christians have prayed daily, how they've prayed daily specifically, and what exactly is behind the focuses and the theology that these Christians had in their daily walk of life and their daily prayers to God. First, let us begin by talking about what we mean by daily prayer. What you will often hear within the magisterial refor reformers or uh, within the Roman Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church is the spirituality behind the daily office is that it is our daily work of prayer. Now, work and prayer might not sometimes seem like they're supposed to go together. Isn't prayer supposed to be some um, enlightening or something that is pleasant to do? Well, of course it can be, but guess what? So can work. Work also has a sanctifying part to it, especially if it's a work that you very much enjoy. And I'm not talking about like vocational work, such as working as an electrician, or working as an engineer, or working as a doctor. These things can be the same, but work more generally is what we do with ourselves. You can do work in your backyard just as much as you can do work at your vocational job. But the idea of work is a sanctifying thing within the Christian tradition. And prayer as being a part of our daily work is indeed a focus that Christians have always had. It is an, our holy obligation, our holy duty to say our daily prayers, whatever form that those prayers may come in. Because at the very basis of all of this, prayer is about our response to God. God is already advancing towards us. God always and everywhere will advance towards us in relationship. We have to have the repentance within ourselves and ask God for that repentance to be able to turn ourselves towards God in like manner. One of the ways that we practice our repentance of changing our minds, of changing our orientation of our bodies, is by our daily prayer. Relationship is what prayer is based in as well. It's very, very difficult to have a deep relationship with someone that you don't spend daily time with, especially for you who have, uh, who care for loved ones, or who have kids, or who have 
um, romantic partners. It is really hard to foster those relationships if you don't work at it daily. Once again, I use that word work, right? We work at relationships. We invest our efforts and our time in the relationships that matter. And for Christians, daily prayer is investing in the most important relationship that we have, which is our relationship with God. Work, sometimes referred to as the officium um, or the office. This word office that we get um, refers to work. It's a Latin word that refers to work. And so the daily office of prayer this is what you'll hear referred to as the particular services of prayer called the daily office. Um, these are our daily work of prayer that we are to take up as a practice as we, as um, some would say, sanctify the time. Um, just as St. Paul might say, sanctify the time for the days are evil. We, in our daily work of prayer, are, again, fostering our relationship with God in Christ Jesus, doing the daily work of tending to that relationship. But there's also, of course, another part of that work, which is that we are bringing our prayers and intercessions before God the Father on behalf of those things that need to be brought before God in prayer. Prayer does stuff. Prayer throughout Christian history always has done stuff. Bringing our intercessions to God, especially in the good examples of, like, for example, in the book of Hebrews, when it talks about the faith that our ancestors have had in Christ, such as the faith of Elijah, who by faithful asking in prayer asked God for a drought in, in Israel during his time, and it happened for longer than three years. And likewise, when he prayed again, then rain came. God listens, and God will accomplish those things which accord with God's will. This is why in the, in the Lord's Prayer, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, we are to pray with what accords with God's will so that God may accomplish it. Jesus even said this. You do not have because you do not ask. Ask what accords with the will of the Father. And all of these things will be added unto you. Do what is according with God's will, and your prayers in asking in faith will be answered. And so... Daily office is a very, very important part of Christianity's practice of, uh, of daily prayer because we are bringing, bringing to God, we are bringing of ourselves those things that we ask for God in good faith, such as a loved one who is sick, of which we are lifting up in prayer, or something that is going on within national life or something that's going on within community life that needs to be prayed about. An important decision in your own life that you need to seek the guidance of God for. All of these things are encompassed within the, the, the aspect of daily prayer. But historic Christianity, in our approach to daily prayer, has a couple of ways in which daily prayer happens. So if you um, watch our morning prayers, you might recognize where I'm sitting, which is I'm sitting um, in the part of the church where this is called a prayer desk right here. It has a kneeler down here where um, when you say your prayers, you can kneel on it, and it has a place for books to sit right here. But prayer desks and the practice of prayer within a church setting like this is a specific model of prayer even. Um, and it has its roots within the early church of where do you do your daily prayer? How are you supposed to accomplish your daily prayer? Who does the daily prayer? 
It's all of those various questions of function and theology as to what develops. Well, in the earliest church, here's what we see developing within daily prayer. We have two particular models that start to become important within the life of the church, and they have to do with the history of the church. One model is called the monastic model. The monastic model of daily office is, of course, as its name suggests, a direct development out of the monastic movement of the early church. The monks and nuns who dedicate themselves to living unmarried, to um, certain vows that they make before God of asceticism, of very, very strict discipline, because they are disciplining themselves to, um, in order to be doing the service of God. The monastic model of the daily office is a complex, a very complex set of things that are done. So, like we talked about um, liturgy, whenever I refer to liturgy is simply referring to the uh, way that this service will go. So, monastic model of daily, daily office is a complex liturgy. It has a lot of parts in there, and it is a long service. But the monastic office was developed to be laity-led. In other words, it's not the clergy who are doing these things. It is the laity, the laos, which is a Greek word that means people. Um, it is the laity who are doing the monastic office, because the monastic office most explicitly is usually referring to the offices that develop out of St. Benedict of Nursia. You might recognize uh, Benedict's name from Benedictine monks and nuns, um, or the Benedictine spirituality that come out of this particular prayer practice. But Benedict um, designed his particular uh, monastic profession and understood his monastic profession as something that is not really um, designed to have clergy be a part of it. In fact, in St. Benedict's rule, um, St. Benedict um, is very suspect of clergy who wish to be Benedictines, um, who wish to be a part of this particular monastic kind of, uh, kind of um, uh, observance. And the reason why Benedict is suspect is because for Benedict, the daily rotation of prayer is not supposed to be clergy-led. It's supposed to be lay-led. And it's supposed to be out of the body of Christ offering prayers on behalf of the church. And specifically for St. Benedict, it is about the monastery. It is about um, the place where the brothers or the sisters live. And it is about um, the abbot who is the, uh, the father of all of the monastics that are there. Um, and the abbot, by the way, in, in, Benedictine, uh, in Benedictine practice is often not ordained. Um, and so it's all about the, uh, the leading of the laity uh, vowed monastics within the Benedictine model. But the monastic model of daily prayer is a very complex liturgy. For example, the monastic model contains many, many, many psalms within it. The psalms, by the way, are some of the basic backbone of the prayer office um, for Christians for time immemorial. The psalms are where we start. And so Benedictines, you might know, um, strict Benedictines, um, and especially uh, of most of the monastics that are born out of the monastic movements, such as, such as the Cistercian monks, um, such as Augustinian monks, so on and so forth, they actually recite the entire Psalter, all 150 or 151, depending on which Bible you're using, all 150 or so Psalms every week. Every week, those who are vowed monastics in the more strict traditions of monasticism will go through the entire Psalter in a week. And in fact, um, a requirement for some Eastern Orthodox bishops 
for uh, being able to be ordained as bishops is that they have to be able to recite the Psalter from memory. Can you imagine having to be able to do that? However, the practice of daily office, especially with the Psalms being a huge part of this, it's no, uh, it's not too much of a stretch. If you go through the Psalter every single week, week in, week out, in your daily prayers, to all of a sudden start having the Word indwell in you. That when all of a sudden you've recited something, uh, especially uh, with, within like a year, just imagine uh, going a year, and saying the entire Psalter 52 times, you pretty much will have some of those Psalms down by heart. But the monastic office also includes many spiritual readings from, of course, the Bible. Um, they also may contain readings from some of the important theologians or church fathers. Um, but elaborate, long prayers. And then you also have another model that is occurring um, within the context of the daily office cycle, which is something called the cathedral model. The cathedral model is different from the monastic in that it is shorter and simpler. It is a far shorter, far easier um, way of getting into the prayers that doesn't take too much time, doesn't take a whole lot of effort um, to have to do a whole bunch of memorization and things like that. But it's also led by clergy. So the cathedral models are going to be clergy-led that are primarily uh, part of the work of the clergy is to foster the daily office. Um, and so if you wonder what kind, of, uh, what kind of practice we have here at Trinity Parish, guess what? We have the cathedral model. Um, because at the moment, um, it is the clergy who are leading the morning prayer, and especially uh, during our particular times that we find ourselves in, um, especially with, uh, with COVID-19, um, it is uh, something that I do remotely, um, but it is still um, a particular model of prayer that is clergy-led, um, but it's a shorter and simpler version of the monastic model. Um, and actually, when we start talking about the Book of Common Prayer, um, the Book of Common Prayer is somewhat of a mix between the monastic model and the cathedral model. Um, the monastic model that, uh, that is uh, Benedictine, the Book of Common Prayer owes so much of its DNA to Benedictine spirituality that it's sometimes hard to separate um, from the way that we do our morning prayers and our evening prayers. But that's for a later point in time. The main thing to understand is that you have two particular models that are developing within the Christian tradition. You have the monastic, a complex, lay-led, vowed monastic particular kind of daily prayer. You also have the cathedral model, which is clergy-led, shorter, simpler. That's, those are the main things you need to know. Because as we start walking along throughout the history of Christianity, you'll see why these two models will become very important to understand how they are within their own focuses. Because think about the different focuses theologically that's going on. A lay-led, vowed monastic model of complex kinds of liturgy has a certain kind of theological underpinning to it, doesn't it? In other words, it is the vowed work of the laity, and it is the work of those who are not clergy to have a daily prayer routine. Now, this, if you think about it, is actually not too far off from a lot of the more evangelical Protestant kind of understanding of this. It might not be a set liturgy, it might not be a particular um, recitation of the Psalms or traditional prayers, but is it not the case where um, within the evangelical Protestant model, the emphasis on personal devotion is very important. Lay devotion. It is part of our fostering of our relationship with God. Um, often through scriptural reading, often through personal extemporaneous prayer, but still, you, it's still the same idea. 
the monastic model is simply a particular expression of that. But think about the cathedral model, where it's clergy-led. The cathedral model is perhaps more particularly top-down in structure, in that it is the clergy leading the laity. In other words, it is the clergy's responsibility to facilitate the prayers that the laity join in. Um, this has a particular kind of focus as well, in which um, part of the main work of the clergy is to foster the daily prayers and to teach the daily prayers to the laity. Not that the laity can never say the daily prayers, but it's just that the way that the, uh, the service is led is in a church by the clergy of the particular parish and for the laity to start fostering their own daily prayer work along with the life of the parish itself. But those two models become important when we start looking at the history of Christianity. When we look at the church fathers and mothers, we get some hints as to what exactly these offices begin to look like. For example, one person that we've talked about several times as it came to baptism and the, and the Holy Communion is Hippolytus. And Hippolytus is going to be describing uh, certain uh, particular practices within the very early church. Hippolytus describes particular private office hours of the, uh, of the clergy or vowed monastics at the third hour, sixth hour, and ninth hour. Now, the reason why this is important is, uh, is that um, when you have the monastic developments, you have the certain hours that you say your daily prayers. Um, this is sometimes referred to as the holy hours, or sometimes referred to as the office hours, the daily office hours, um, the hours of prayer, so to speak. Not necessarily that, that prayer is a whole hour, but that you say prayer at certain points during the day. Now, what's helpful to remember is that the third, sixth, and ninth hour is not the same thing as three o'clock, six o'clock, and nine o'clock. What this is referring to is the third hour of daylight, the, the sixth hour of daylight, and the ninth hour of daylight, which roughly translates to 9 a.m. in the morning, noon, and 3 p.m. in the afternoon for, for us in, in, modern, uh, in our, our more contemporary idea of time. But the reason why this is important is because um, these certain office hours become codified um, as to when you say the daily office within the monastic and cathedral models so that you can know when to expect to say your office prayers. But what also ends up happening during this time is that hymnody begins to be written that includes some of our most ancient hymns and some of our most important hymns, such as the two office hymns that become associated with morning and evening. The morning hymn being the Gloria in Excelsis, um, which is based upon the acclamation of the angels, uh, which meet the shepherds in St. Luke. But at the night office, you have something called the Fos Hilaron, which is the O Gracious Light. It's a specifically evening tide or nighttime office hymn. And these are associated very heavily with the actual prayer offices themselves. In fact, if you look at our Book of Common Prayer, these two hymns are included within our morning and nighttime prayer, uh, prayer offices. Now, the fourth century, so this is in the 300s, the cathedral office model uh, begins to take shape into a certain kind of, uh, con uh, not cer necessarily condensed, but a certain kind of flow. There's a certain order in which you do things. So the cathedral office model, again, being the shorter, more simple, clergy-led uh, model, has certain versicles that you say to, to uh, begin the particular um, office time, such as, like we say in the morning, um, Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise, or at night, O oh God, make speed to save us, O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Um, that particular, those are versicles, uh, as they refer to, because um, they are responsorial in that I say one part, the, the people say another part, or whoever is officiating will say one part, and then the people will say another. So I would say, O oh God, make speed to save us. The people will respond, O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Those are called versicles. Then you would have a psalm or a hymn. Um, 
the psalm coming from the Psalter, the hymn um, often being one of the more traditional hymns that are based upon biblical text. Then you would have prayers or a particular prayer um, being said, and then you'd have the Lord's Prayer after everything is done. Now, a very easy way to look at the cathedral model, um, if you would like to have an example of this, is actually Noonday Prayer within the Book of Common Prayer. Um, the Noonday Prayer in the Book of Common Prayer is very much a cathedral office model, where you have versicles to begin, a psalm or a hymn that then follows. Then you have the option of having short, of having short readings from Holy Scripture. Then you have the prayers then you have the Lord's Prayer, and then you have an ending prayer or an ending verse of Scripture before the dismissal. And that's very much a very cathedral office model kind of look right there. But all of these things that are said about the office and what exactly is contained within the office, it's very important to keep in mind the point of these offices is to foster daily prayer, a daily rotation of prayer. And the reason why the observances at certain hours of the day is very important is because setting particular times during the day allows us to have a regular rhythm of prayer. The rhythm of prayer is one of the most important things for the early church because it is part of our daily life and work. Um, it's not meant to be just kind of whenever you feel like it. It's supposed to be a daily thing, whether you feel like it or not. To end today's lesson, I'll tell you a short story illustrating this particular point. When I went to seminary over at the School of Theology in Sewanee, Tennessee, every day we have morning prayer, the Holy Communion at noon, and evening prayer in the evening. Every single day, we have that rotation of prayer because for us in our practice as seminarians, the most important thing that we have to remember is that it's not our minds that are being fed primarily. It is that we are feeding our spirits by our daily encounter with God. One of the most important things about seminary is the daily encounter in prayer. But a particular professor, a very beloved professor uh, from the seminary, was saying the daily office, and a student uh, with a, a group was leaving at the time, and the student uh, remarked uh, in somewhat of a frustrated fashion, said, man, that just felt like work this morning. And the professor, hearing what the student just said, spun around and looked at them right in the eyes and said, good and then walked off. Sometimes daily prayer is work. It's not something that is always pleasant. Prayer is not built for our convenience. It's built for our sanctification. Daily prayer is not often enjoyable, but what it is, is it is an avenue for us to continually practice and be transformed by our encounter with Christ Jesus. And that is more important than our convenience and the way that we feel in the mornings. Especially when you're getting up for morning prayer in the mornings and you have kids that you're trying to get to school and you have uh, breakfast that you're trying to make and there's all the hustle and bustle of trying to get ready for the day. Sometimes the last thing that we really want to do is our daily prayers. But yet, those are the times that are extremely important and formative for us as Christians in our relationship with Christ. Never neglect your daily prayers. And as we continue to talk about the history of daily prayer, always remember it's been a vitally important aspect for Christianity throughout all generations. Thank you so much for joining for our first session over daily office prayer. Next time, we will be talking about the development of the monastic model and the cathedral model that we talked about today, and also the medieval developments as it comes to our practice of daily prayer. But until then, friends, be safe and may God bless you.